Welcome, everyone. There's seats around, so um, if you're standing and like to come sit down, please don't be shy. Uh, my name is Joseph Sullivan. Uh, I'm a pediatric epileptologist from the University of California in San Francisco, uh, where I direct the epilepsy program there. I was invited to speak at one of these Ask the Experts uh, uh, stage uh, events with a specific topic of of treatments that are uh, new treatments or those that are on the, on the horizon. I don't have a, a canned uh, talk. Uh, I can certainly do that, but I swear I'll put you to sleep. Um, so this is really meant to be dynamic and, and interactive to give you all the opportunity to ask me some specific questions that may, be, that you may have come up uh, over the last three to six months as your uh, doctors or child's doctors uh, have talked about some of these uh, these new treatments. Um, so I think in order to make it the, the most efficient use of everyone's time, I'm more than happy to answer specific question about your child, your loved one, yourself, uh, and how it pertains to your epilepsy diagnosis, your epilepsy journey. Um, but obviously, this isn't a one hour visit that I can sit down and get all those details. So I'm gonna try to refrain from giving specific uh, management uh, uh, things. Um, but maybe we'll just open it up for, uh, well, I should also say some of my research interests. So some of my research interests uh, over the last five years have been in some of the rare pediatric genetic epilepsies, specifically Dravet syndrome and PCDH19 epilepsy. And I've participated in some of the clinical trials of some of the drugs um, uh, that are uh, either getting ready to get approved or are in the process of just the studies just getting started. Uh, so I can answer any questions about um, those types of uh, things. And then just one disclaimer, I know we're supposed to end at 12.50 and often what happens is people then come up and, and ask me questions afterward. I have to be at the opposite end of the hotel to give another talk at one. So if I'm not being rude if I try to scurry out uh, uh, the door. So, um, but if you wouldn't mind, if you have a question, just uh, maybe just state your name, where, where you are currently living and cared for, um, and then uh, we'll open it up uh, for questions. Someone's got to be the person to ask the first one, right? And then, really, discussion will get flowing. Yes? Okay, so once and your name, and where are you oh, from? I'm sorry. My name is Kim, and I'm from Maine. Okay, great. Um, once a drug is approved, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. So the question is, once a drug is FDA approved, how long does it take for a doctor uh, or doctors to start using that drug? Uh, as you can imagine, it's really wide and varied. I think first uh, it's important to talk about when a drug gets approved by the FDA, um, it usually has an indication for which it's approved for, right? And this is where I'm going to be a little bit selfish here. This has been a really exciting time for pediatric epilepsy because up until about five years ago, all of the drugs that got approved or studied for epilepsy were first studied in adults. And they were studied in adults with what called focal seizures or partial onset seizures. And then we as the epileptologists had to sit around and wait for the companies to do the pediatric studies before I myself would feel comfortable introducing that, that new drug into one of my, one of my pediatric patients. Um, thankfully, now there's a lot of renewed interest uh, in the, um, the pharmacy, uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, community about studying some of these rare genetic epilepsies. And now it's actually going full circle that there are everyone sitting in the room with their kid or their loved one that have their own genetic epilepsy and say, hey, what about me? You know, don't have this all be about Dravet syndrome or don't have this be all about, uh, and we hear you and I think the, the companies are hearing you. Um, and so people are um, uh, reaching out to say, what, what, um, what can we do to get your drug studied in these different patient populations? So that's a long-winded sort of backdrop to, uh, to say that uh, most physicians are driven by data. Uh, and the data, not necessarily about how effective a drug is, um, because if a drug gets approved by the FDA, it has to have been shown to be effective, um, but more so the safety, right? We're taught in medical school that children are not little adults, right? And that is so true uh, in the epilepsy community as well. And so I often, without any preliminary data about safety, how to dose uh, these new medications, I'm a bit of a wimp. Um, when it comes to the, the drugs, if they come out with an approval for adults uh, to, to use them in children. 
Um, but I think it's now when a drug gets approved, uh, then each of the individual companies send out their, their representatives to try and educate uh, uh, the providers about what role that drug may have, maybe give some, some uh, guidance in terms of what's on the label, in terms of dosing, uh, and, and so on. So um, does that answer your question? Yeah? OK. Uh, but I, and I think that you know, we are creatures of habit. Um, um, as, as much as I'm hearing the topic is sort of new and upcoming drugs, right? A lot of the old drugs um, still work for a lot of people, right? Um, but there's always this, this stubborn number of 30 to 35 percent of patients that are living with epilepsy that are continuing to have seizures despite the now more than 30 medications that we have available. So when people ask me, you know, do we really need another drug in that list, uh, I think the answer is almost always yes, because the more tools I have in my you know, toolbox, the more options I can give to each individual, individual patient. Yes? Yes. Yes. So great question. So uh, the question is, are there any fundamentally new drugs sort of in the pipeline that have different mechanisms? So the answer is yes, but then the embarrassing qu the answer that I can follow up that with is many of the drugs that come out, we actually don't know how they work. We really don't know how they work. Um, and uh, you know, there, there are a number of animal models that these drugs are studied in. I work with a colleague um, uh, at UCSF who actually has a zebrafish model of Dravet syndrome. And these, these fish basically seize. Um, and he can use a special camera to, to track the seizure behavior in these in these fish, and he basically did uh, a study um, where he took 5,000 FDA compounds that are already FDA approved um, and out there uh, either being used or not being used, and in a blinded manner, he put the drug in the water and tracked to see if the fish stopped seizing and did this in a way that he wasn't biased uh, in terms of, oh, well, this is a drug that works in this way, therefore it's probably going to work for seizures. And he stumbled on a few compounds that made us think, what the heck is going on here? How can these actually be uh, anti-seizure? And lo and behold, when you start to look at those drugs, that's when you start to try to have a, a theory or a hypothesis of how they, how they could work. So I would say that um, one of the hot new um, uh, areas is in the serotonin um, receptor pathway. He actually found uh, three drugs in, in his uh, model. Um, that worked. One of them um, is already on the market and is a, is a weight loss drug called Lorca Sarin. Um, the, tr the trade name is Belvic. Um, then there's another drug that's uh, just finished clinical trials called Fenfluramine um, that's been submitted for FDA approval. And then there's a third drug called Clemazole, which actually is a drug that was an antihistamine back in the 1950s. Right? So here's a perfect example. Who would give, everyone probably tells you, or you, you know, don't give your kid Benadryl because it can worsen seizures. Um, and here is an old antihistamine, similar to Benadryl, that actually worked at stopping seizures in these fish. And so when he looked at other mechanisms by which that drug worked, stumbled upon that that drug also has a secondary mechanism that's through the serotonin pathway. So um, I think that's a hot um, 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 path. Um, the cannabidiol from Epidiolex uh, is obviously approved uh, now for lennox gastaut and for um, Dravet syndrome. But interestingly there, we don't really know the full mechanism by which it works, but we do know that it works differently than the other drugs in our toolbox. So it's, 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 um, it's comforting to know how it doesn't work, right? But we still, there's a lot of work being going on that's trying to clarify uh, how it is working. Then there are drugs, and I could go through these, I don't want this to be a biochemistry lecture, but um, there are drugs that work at a, at a, a cholesterol um, a pathway. Um, that's a drug being um, developed by Ovid Therapeutics. And right now it just has a number, TAC965, nine, nine, I think is what it is, or 935. Um, and all of these drugs, though, are anti-seizure drugs. That's actually, but there's being a big push to not call these drugs anti-epileptic drugs anymore. Um, they're anti-seizure drugs. Um, but really, what we're, I think the, the community really wants things to, the direction we really would like to see things go in, are in some of the disease modifying therapies, right? So hopefully you'll go to some of the other talks here in terms of, we're still kind of in a black box of treating epilepsy, right? You have seizures, you kind of have these types of seizures. If we get lucky enough, we can put you into a specific syndrome. 
myself and my colleagues try to operate within a framework and to treat those patients, but it's still just, it's still throwing water on a fire, right? Uh, it's doing nothing to the coals or to the sparks or how the heck did the fire get started, right? And so now I think with advances in genetic panels and, and whatnot, we're able to be much more precise in terms of what is the underlying cause of that person's epilepsy, so that now all these new genetic technologies can actually go in and try to either fix the gene, which would be the real goal, right? Because as much as we talk about seizures, it's all of the other things that, that affect uh, uh, our kids. And, and again, I'm a pediatric epileptologist, I'll always fix kids. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, hope I'm not being disrespectful to adults. Um, so, but it's all of those other comorbidities that we feel if we get to the underlying cause could actually really help, um, help those patients in the best way. And there are some, some therapies that are going into clinical trials that essentially do just that. They actually go in and, and allow the, the neurons or the cells to actually make some of the proteins that are lacking uh, in some of these genetic epilepsy models. Yes? For the rescue drugs, are you talking about the drugs that actually stop the seizure once it's started? Like, we currently use diastat, which I guess is the pretty most common one. I know there's some other ones that are used for, like, teenagers and above, like the nasal ones. Mm-hmm. Yes. Our daughter's only five, so, but typically, the one when the ambulance comes out and they give her a different shot, it stops said, yeah. yeah. So um, once they give her that one, it stops quicker than it does with the diastat. Mm -hmm. um, I guess your thoughts on like which rescue drugs maybe we should be yeah. advocating for from our doctor? Or yeah, absolutely. So the question is, is about rescue drugs and, and what rescue drugs are out there in, in the pipeline in terms of trying to help abort seizures, right? So these are the abortive medications that are given uh, when a seizure starts or one to two minutes into the seizure, depending on each individual child. And, and um, you know, the main class of drugs that we still have available to us, which are really, really old drugs, are the benzodiazepines. So these are really the drugs that end in, in, in AM, right? So diazepam, midazolam, uh, lorazepam, um, they're all benzodiazepines with slightly um, different structures. Clobazam is the, the one that's the sort of newest on the block in the US, even though it's been available in Europe for more than 20 years. And there's really no, I shouldn't say no, I gotta, I gotta be careful when I speak in these extremes, right? Um, it's, it's difficult to predict which of those benzodiazepine drugs is gonna work for each individual patient. I've had patients where just diacet just doesn't work. Families just like, oh, we've given three, three of the doses and it doesn't do anything, whereas something like midazolam does work. So it really is fine tuning what works um, for your child. And so if you've found almost accidentally that when EMS comes and they give midazolam, that that was effective for her. Um, then there are forms right now of midazolam that you can you can basically give the nasal spray, even in a five-year-old, you said, um, that can be given in a five-year-old. And this gets back to the opening question about FDA approval. A lot of these things, right, we, we can use, even though they don't have FDA approval for that specific uh, indication. Uh, so basically, we prescribe the IV form that the EMS has probably given with a giving with a special um, foam atomizer that goes onto the tip that uh, j um, converts the, the liquid into a spray so that it can be sprayed into nose. There are some companies that are working because it's not really user friendly, right? Your poor child's seizing, you're trying to draw up this stuff and screw the thing on the top and squirt it in her nose. Um, and so there are some companies that are working on some sort of ready to go locked and loaded uh, forms of midazolam. And there's also some companies that are working on an oral form uh, of some of these benzodiazepines like Valium. So similar, that's the same exact drug that's in diastat, but you can actually give in the cheek and it actually opens up some of the, the cells in the, in the uh, side of the cheek and gets directly into the bloodstream as opposed to it having to, I always quote that Pepto-Bismol commercial, right? So it's like instead of having to go down and get absorbed in your stomach and then get into the bloodstream and then get into the brain, that can take 30 minutes sometimes, right? So uh, a drug that can be given directly that opens up those, those cells in the, the buccal mucosa is also being, um, being developed, so. And then the last one I've heard um, is um, an EpiPen. 
uh, like de device, uh, like an uh, intermuscular auto injector um, that can also um, just be locked and loaded and ready to go and give something like midazolam uh, in the muscle. So, um, so I think if you have those experiences where you're like, doc, this has worked, then let your doctor know that. Um, and, you know, they should be, you know, open to trying to find a way that you could do that, um, you know, yourself at home. Yes? So there's not a commercially FDA approved nasal spray available yet. Um, what we have to do in San Francisco is we have a few pharmacies that we uh, work with closely uh, and we ask them if they can order the IV formulation of midazolam and that's where the, the user sort of clunkiness comes in um, because you are having to draw it up and you can't draw it up beforehand because no one knows how stable it remains once you draw it out of the bottle. So it's, it's a few more steps. But it's essentially the same drug that, that the paramedics are given IV. Um, and there have been some small studies that have done in hospitals that show that giving the midazolam, either spraying it in the cheek, giving it in the nose, and comparing IV is similar. So, and since you brought up PCH19, and it's something that um, you know, I, I uh, do some research in, this gets into that not all the benzos are the same. So one advantage of midazolam is that it's, it's quick acting and short acting, right? And so if you don't want to have the long half-life of something like diacet, which the half-life of diacet actually can actually be 48 to 60 hours, um, whereas midazolam, it's two to four hours, okay? So that can be a pro and a con, right? So in PCH19, if your daughter has cluster seizures, has one, and then you know that she's going to have 10 more in the next 24 hours, Midazolam may actually not be the best choice because it may get in there and stop that one seizure, but then it's going to be out of her system in two to four hours and the cluster could ramp up again. I still do use midazolam in some of my PCH19 patients because sometimes it's just once that first seizure is stopped, it doesn't get, get the ball rolling. Um, but that would be one thing to keep in mind as opposed to some of the longer acting benzos um, actually could play a bigger role in someone who you know is going to have a cluster for 24 to 40 hours. But again, everyone is going to be um, a little bit different. That's no, all right. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know the answer to that. Even when we ask the reps and things, they don't want to commit to giving us a timeline, but it's soon. It's probably within the next year. Yes. Um, so should I... I don't want to be promoting, uh, like yeah. Um, so what, so it's a questive, right? Is, is Reted, I mean, I can lean on our, our pharmacy people who are here, who are working and do you want to g give any timeline? See, I told you, I'm letting you off the hook, but a questive therapeutics. Yeah. So a questive therapeutics. And if you look in, you can see their pipeline and things there. So sure. Yes. Yes. Well, there is. Um, so there was an, a study that was just completed for tuberous sclerosis complex of uh, epidiolex, so, and that showed that it was uh, effective. So that will be being submitted, and I can rely on my Greenwich to soon, right? It's being submitted to FDA for relabeling. So. Um, and as far as I know, from a strict seizure perspective, there's a study going on in Rett syndrome um, where seizures are being looked at, but some of the other behavioral and cognitive outcomes are really the main focus on that. And that's it. There's not any other new epilepsy trial that I know of um, right now. This is where I think um, as, as clinicians, you know, the label is important. Right? But um, if we look at the three indications that Epidiolex has been approved for, right, Dravet syndrome, lennox gastaut syndrome, uh, and tuberous sclerosis complex. Um, so first of all, you have Dravet and, and tuberous sclerosis that have a very strong genetic um, uh, background. And then you have lennox gastaut syndrome, which can be caused by anything. And in those three, three epilepsy diagnoses, you basically have 
every, almost every single seizure type covered. And so when you have studies that show efficacy in three very different epilepsy diagnoses, that, in my opinion, builds a very strong case that it's, it's an epilepsy drug, right? Um, now, the fights that we get into is the insurance companies, right? And that's where the label is not only from a safety perspective in terms of dosing and the side effects that you look out for, but from an insurance perspective, we have to do more fighting um, with them. It's not, it's not impossible, uh, uh, but more fighting uh, with them to get those drugs approved if they're off-label. Yes? Yes. And the compassion. Yes. So, so one mechanism that some companies do is they, they have the, the efficacy and safety data completed. So the studies are done. Um, but, and so then, but the drug's not yet approved. And that can often take six months or longer. So six months for the FDA approve and then, you know, getting how it's made and shipped and pharmacies and things like that. Um, and so acknowledging that there are, there are patients that could benefit from a new drug, but we have this sort of six month wait. Um, uh, there are these what are called compassionate use programs. And so it's essentially a study, um, but uh, so there's an informed consent form and everything because there are risks and then because it's not uh, uh, approved yet um, by the FDA. Uh, and there is a handful of centers that participated in the phase three trials in the country. Um, because we are used, and we're one of those centers, um, we're used to using the drug, we know how to dose it, we know the side effect profile, and so those were the handful of centers that were, were allowed to open up um, these expanded access programs. I know my colleague Scott Perry, I think he's speaking the other side, uh, and he's speaking tomorrow, he's down at, um, at Cook Children's in Fort Worth. Uh, I know he has a, a, a site. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Nupp in, in Denver, uh, is also a site. So there's a handful of sites sprinkled around. And really the goal is, you know, if, if your child is still having uncontrolled or poorly controlled seizures and is not, doesn't have any other medical contraindications, um, then they would be potentially eligible for that. So sort of. Yes, so we, so it, much like a study, right, there's sort of a baseline to make sure that, that your blood counts are okay and that your liver function and kidney function is normal. Because of the concerns of fenfluramine's history with, with cardiac safety, uh, there still is a requirement to get an echocardiogram. Uh, so far, we haven't seen any concerning safety signals um, with fenfluramine, but we're still obviously want to follow, follow that. So yes, there are some things, much like when you're starting valproate, right? Um, you need to get some liver function and, and things like that just to make sure that there's no contraindication to starting the drug. Yes? Minnesota. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so, so clinical trial design in epilepsy is, is very, um, it's very important to design a trial uh, in, a, in, a, uh, um, in a smart way because you could have a drug that actually works, but unless you design the trial in the right way that you're counting the right things, um, the drug may work, but it may just get lost in the statistics and will not come out as being effective. And so most trials, as you know from the, uh, from the fenfluramine trial, most trials of Lennox-Gastaut syndrome um, count drop seizures. And so drop seizures is, is, in my opinion, not really a seizure type, right? It's what happens during different types of seizures. So you can have a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, and of course that's gonna cause someone to drop. You can have an atonic seizure where, boom, so, and that's gonna cause you to drop. Or you can have a tonic seizure. Those are probably the three big ones. There's others um, that, that you could, you know, still have a focal motor seizure and drop. Um, but for the purposes of the drug studies, they try to lump those, all those seizure types together. And I actually review some of these forms um, to make sure that the seizures are, are labeled in a way that, that one, makes sense, two, that the caregiver can identify and reliably count, uh, and three, uh, that we think actually are seizures, right? We also want to make sure that, that what we're counting as seizure is a seizure, right? We know our kids do a lot of different things, and if it's not a seizure, then we really don't expect an anti-seizure drug to work. And so the types of seizures that were 
looked at as the primary outcome measure in the Epidiolex trial were those seizures and are very similar to the, the trial, um, to the fenfluramine trial, and are very similar to the Clobazam trial, right? The Clobazam, in fact, most of the studies kind of um, borrowed, I don't want to say st stole, um, but borrowed the, the definition of what is a drop seizure from the Clobazam trial so that we could be, um, be consistent. Um, and so what we see, um, and I can't remember your last question there. So, um, so we see efficacy uh, for Epidiolex in reducing drop seizures in patients uh, with Lennox Gusteau. And the numbers are sort of in the 45% um, reduction not, um, part. And as you've probably lived uh, or, or hopefully have lived um, with your experiences that these drugs can be, you know, this percent reduction, right? These trials, some kids start out with 100 seizures a month and then they get, a, let's just say, a 50% reduction, so they go down to 50. But someone who starts with, with 10 seizures a month still goes down to 50. So the brain shouldn't, you know, why does the brain care about percentages, right? And so that's why we hope that as these newer treatments come out and that are syndrome specific, maybe we go from one drug from 100 to 50, and then the next drug you get another 50%, you go 50 to 25. And again, we want to minimize the amount of drugs that our kids are taking. Uh, certainly we want to get away with, the, you know, ideally one. Um, but if we can get that additive effect, I think that's really going to be, it's, it's, I'm excited to have all these new, new tools in my toolbox over the next few years just to see how they work potentially together. Because right now we don't know. Yes? Mm -hmm. so, and, and the side effect of, uh, of Epidiolex? Yeah, and I should, I should also do a disclaimer. You know, you'll, you'll walk around the exhibit hall and you know, not all CBDs are the same, right? Um, so we have the one FDA-approved um, cannabidiol that is Epidiolex that uh, was in all the clinical trials, but there are a host of other um, uh, types that are available to, to patients and families. Um, and in my experience, you really can't compare them. And you guys have taught me uh, about this, right? I mean, there are people who try different different types, different strains, and even the dosages are completely different. So, you know, someone who's on five milligrams per kilogram of brand A, um, that does not equate to five milligrams per kilogram of, of Epidiolex or even brand B. Um, and so, um, but the side effects I do think are fairly um, consistent. So uh, some of the GI side effects, um, so diarrhea and decreased appetite. And whenever I tell people that, I always get like a giggle. They're like, oh, I thought CBD is supposed to like give you the money. But, so anyway, so we're really looking at uh, generally uh, 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 cannabidiol preparations that are, that are high in the cannabidiol and low in THC. But there's a lot of, uh, of sort of uh, experience with families using small amounts of THC. And they've found that that's um, um, been helpful for, for their kids. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it, is a, it, it still is a drug, right? And so it does have drug-drug interactions, right? It's, it's metabolized by the liver. And so it can actually um, increase the, the concentrations of some other drugs. And that actually can maybe lead to some of the somnolence. In my experience, most of the time, if you make adjustments to some of the background drugs, you can really uh, uh, minimize that, that amount of somnolence. But again, everyone's going to be uh, going to be a little bit different. Yes. Yeah, so our daughter is intractable because she's still multiple uh, drugs, and now she's on Zimpat. Mm -hmm. um, is there, you mentioned just now about the, about, you know, dropping to 50% and then maybe combining all the drugs to get less. Is there any combination, you know, that go with Zimpat? Yeah. I talked to one doctor who said it does kind of work well with the drugs. Yeah, so it's a great question. So this gets back to the initial, like, novel mechanism of action. We, we kind of have this phrase that we use in our field called rational polypharmacy. It almost sounds like an oxymoron, right? Because it's like, of course, we don't want someone on more than one drug. But if we're going to choose a second drug, you know, let's not choose two drugs that work you know, in fundamentally the same way, right? So that's where it's important for us to at least understand the main or primary mechanism of action, which for Vimpad, it's a sodium channel blocker, but it acts at blocking the slow sodium currents, whereas something like carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine, which are our Tegretol trileptol, works more at the faster sodium channels. So, but there's still a sodium channel, right? So I would say that while those two combinations can sometimes be okay together, we would probably want to choose something that doesn't work by the sodium channel um, at all. Um, and there are a lot of other drugs that are non-sodium channel blockers. Um, but 
to specifically answer your question, like, is there like a top one or two candidate drug that works well with Vimpad? I would say the answer to that is no, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So the question is, are there, are there drugs that, so you have the anti-seizure drugs, and then you have the drugs that are actually trying to get at the genetic cause, but are there drugs that maybe don't have a direct impact on seizures, but maybe uh, seizure control, but maybe somehow prevent the, the sparks or the kindling um, uh, and the secondary? So we kind of lump that into, and I should probably just not have you keep, waiting on the edge of your seat, no. <laughs> uh, but that, that whole group of, um, of uh, drugs are called neuroprotective agents, right? And so, um, and, and there's a ton of work um, being done uh, more in the lab and in sort of mouse models of epilepsy to try and look at these neuroprotective agents. Um, so there's some studies that are going on uh, mainly in uh, patients with tuberous sclerosis complex. We know the majority of patients with tuberous sclerosis complex go on to develop epilepsy and, and, and maybe even start out as having a seizure type called infantile spasms. And so there's a trial going on that's called Prevent West. And so what if we actually gave a medication called Vigabitrin, right, which we know is very, very effective in, in patients with tuberous sclerosis complex. What if we actually gave that before they had their first seizure? would it actually do kind of what you're saying and prevent at least the epilepsy from starting in that first year of life? And the trial's ongoing right now. But not specifically like to target the kindling aspect. Um, uh, there's not, to my knowledge, um, anything that's ready for or even close to prime time. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the fenfluramine was one of the fens in the fen fen um, weight loss drug back in the, in the 80s. Uh, and it was taken off the market because uh, patients were developing pulmonary hypertension, so high blood pressures on the lung side of the heart. And in some patients, actually valve changes that actually um, led to heart failure. Um, but by accident, uh, essentially, uh, this drug was discovered um, by a small group in Belgium and a small, actually not a small group, a small group of patients in Belgium um, that when they added it to, um, uh, when they gave it to kids who were actually having some behavior issues because it was known to be a serotonin drug, their seizures improved. And then they did more and more and then they went back and looked at those kids and like, you know, these kids all kind of have some similarities I think they all have Dravet syndrome, and lo and behold, the majority of them did have Dravet syndrome. And that's what kind of led to this, this program of looking at fenfluramine in Dravet syndrome. But getting back to this mechanism of action, right, we know Dravet syndrome, 85% of the kids, it's caused by a mutation in a sodium channel gene, right? And so you actually get 50% less sodium channel um, produced um, by the brain. But why would a serotonin drug uh, necessarily work specifically in patients with Dravet syndrome. We don't know, actually. The feeling is getting back to kind of what I even said about epidiolex, if it works for Dravet syndrome and works for one other epilepsy syndrome, it's probably just an anti-seizure drug. Um, and, and how serotonin, there are definitely some theories about how serotonin and regions or areas of the brain where it's actually expressed serotonin receptors of why it would be a seizure drug. But there's lots of serotonin agents out there, right? There's Prozac, there's Zola. And they all work in a slightly different way. And as best we know, those actually are not um, good anti-seizure drugs. So this gets into where while we think we understand the main mechanism of action, there may be other mechanisms as well. So, um, so that there is a study that just completed in lennox gastaut syndrome. We don't have the results yet. They should be uh, out in early 2020. So yes. Yeah, so SUDEP, the, the fear that we all um, have. Um, so there are uh, some studies to suggest that, that serotonin may actually be involved in patients um, who succumb to, to, to SUDEP. And, and again, it's very exploratory, but, but would a serotonin agent like um, fenfluramine reduce SUDEP risk independent of its anti 
you know, uh, in, in, independent of its anti-seizure or, or seizure um, control. But there's, there's a lot of, I mean, research going on, and there's, a, there's many different theories uh, about uh, SUDEP, but there's still not one that I'm aware of that's kind of leading, uh, leading the leading theory. Um, but people are definitely uh, looking into it. So, yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. So the answer is is yes. I mean, these in all the clinical trials that are going on in pediatric epilepsy, either had been going on or are actively going on, we are very sensitive. And we, as the physicians, when we're asked to comment on these protocols, we will often say it, you have to look at more than just the seizures, right? And I have this statistic that I that I often will. If you do the math of someone who's even having daily seizures. Right? It's still 95% of their life they're, they're spent not seizing, right? But it's all the time that they're running around the house impulsive, don't sleep, uh, aggressive towards the siblings. That that's, those are the real players in terms of quality of life, right? And so we uh, feel very strongly uh, on the, in the physician community that these studies need to be including um, some type of assessment to get at some of these other outcomes, whether it be anxiety, depression, uh, ADHD, overall cognition. The problem is, right, is, is if you're having the, the pretty standard inclusion for a lot of these trials is you have to have four seizures a month because then the trial's for three months and that math just works out that if the drug works and if you're having four seizures a month and you give them someone for three months and you have a chance to show that things go down. But even a drug other than the stimulants, I guess, for, I would say for ADHD, right, you have some patients with ADHD where the stimulants do work for them, you see, a, you see an impact in a week. Right? Other things that are more complicated, like sleep and anxiety and mood and certainly cognition, right? It would be arrogant of me or anyone to think that in a three month period of any treatment, even if it was the best treatment that we had, that we would actually be able to measure a change. Um, so I think what's important is that we're still collecting those data, right? Whether it be a questionnaire, whether it be a you know, parent questionnaire of how their kid is doing but then continue to follow it beyond that three-month treatment trial, six, 12 months later, uh, to see if we do start to, to budge the needle. Because I think that um, two things could be, could be at play. One, um, well, three things, actually. One, the, the drug actually works really well for seizures, but it's got a lousy, lousy side effect profile, right? And so it's potentially going to make some of those things worse. That's no good, right? Two, you have a drug that's really, really effective against seizures, but has a very attractive side effect profile. And even though it may not make those other things better, you may actually see the secondary impact of having less seizures, less rescue meds, et cetera. The third, the sort of the holy grail, right, is that it's a good seizure drug. Um, and independent of the seizure control, you see benefits in, in cognition and other uh, measures. Um, that are not necessarily explained by the seizure control alone. So you have a, someone who has, you know, a 30% improvement in seizures, yet their executive function in, uh, is, is improving. Uh, and there are, um, I think, some, some preliminary uh, data to suggest that some of these new drugs are entering that realm. I was just given the five-minute warning uh, for my uh, uh, time here. So, Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. So we talked about it a little bit, but I think it is important because we, we spend a lot of time here on the preventative medicines, but I think rescue medicines are, are a whole untapped, you know, sort of area where we could improve on. So the nasal spray, the main nasal spray that's available now is essentially the IV form of midazolam. Um, that has to be drawn up and then a little atomizer, uh, which is a little pyramid piece of foam that 
forms a seal around, uh, around the nostril that when you push on the plunger, it makes it, and I demonstrated it for some of my patients, it, the spray is like two feet high. And so during a seizure, uh, and we're talking about even the max dose, so how old is your child? Oh, how, there you go, all right. Um, so the max dose for an adult um, is actually one milliliter uh, on each side. So it's actually a very small amount. And it's basically in saline. So you can actually, even if you were to aspirate it, um, it's going to get absorbed in your, in your lungs as well. So that gets to the end. So it's, it's safe to give during a seizure. And the advantage of that is, is that it's actually getting into the bloodstream through the nasal mucosa. Uh, and so therefore it gets into the blood and therefore into the brain much more quickly than something that is just given orally uh, unless we have some of these new technologies that are trying to open up the mucosa in the cheek to mimic the same thing in the nose. So, and most physicians just have to call your local Rite Aid, Walgreens, et cetera, and just like, I'm a seizure doctor. I understand there's a lot of data about midazolam. I would like to prescribe this IV form of midazolam for nasal use. Yeah, you have to, you have to, that's the one downside is you actually have to draw it up with, like with a plastic needle. You have to draw it out. They're little single dose vials. So you draw it up and then you screw the little thing. If you actually just go onto Google and search um, uh, nasal atomizer, um, then and th th you'll see, and there's actually nice videos from some of my partner institutions that even sh demonstrate how they're actually doing the spray. Yes. Yeah, you know, so some insurances cover it, but it is so cheap. I mean, and it's, it's literally like $5. So that's, yeah, so um, uh, because it's just, it's been around for 30, I mean, it's, it's, it's generic, it's, uh, um, and then the atomizer is a couple of bucks. Um, there, we have one right there. We have one of my patients' moms is showing the atomizer, and the, the so you can go to a demonstration, uh, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Yes, last question. It's a great question. So, um, so as People may know every single, so the question was, are there any drugs that don't have the side effect of depression? Um, so any anti-epileptic, anti anti-seizure drug, the FDA requires now on the package insert that there is the um, black, sort of black box warning about suicidality. Yeah, yeah. And the way that I try to explain this is like all the, in order for a drug to work against seizures, fortunately or unfortunately, it has to get into the brain, right? And if you look at how, what are seizures, seizures very simply are either too much excitation, right, or too little inhibition. And so seizure drugs try to maintain that balance. And so if you have a drug that's getting into the brain and it's meant to calm it, right, one of the potential side effects are going to be this cognitive slowing, mood disorders, and whatnot. So... In the big picture, though, I, and, and I, I believe that, that those side effects, while they occur, that they are relatively uncommon, you know, less than 10% of, of, of patients that, that try it. And that's probably even a, a liberal estimate. Um, and getting back to one of our initial com, um, uh, conversations about mechanism of action, right, if someone has depressed mood on one drug, then... I would switch to something else that has a completely different mechanism of action because some of the, you know, if you're targeting at a different mechanism, then maybe whatever vulnerability, you know, a person has to one drug and having those mood side effects, they, they may not be as vulnerable to a different mechanism. So, um, but that's basically an out to say is I, I think that all of these drugs are, are going to have some small risk um, because we're dealing with the brain and we're dealing with other brain functions that are like mood. So, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, enjoy the conference. There's a wealth of information. So, and I think the most thing is talk to each other. Um, 
because a lot of what I learn uh, is from patients coming to see me and saying, hey, I read this, I read that, I talked to this parent. Sometimes I'll say, oh, that sounds like that craziness. Um, but other times I'm like, oh, let me look into that. So keep talking. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>